I think we have to make our case very vigorously, as I do. I mean, when I meet, for instance, you know, South African foreign minister or talk to them, I would say, look, of course, I want this conflict to end as soon as possible. I don't want to go on for a moment longer than necessary. But a ceasefire to work has got to be sustainable. That means you can't have Hamas in power, able to launch rockets, not releasing hostages. That has got to be dealt with. And I, I think you on, get... On, the, on yes. that, Foreign Secretary, do you believe that military intervention uh, can defeat Hamas? I think that what the what, what the Israelis are trying to do um, is they are trying to get rid of Hamas's ability to <coughs> launch further attacks on Israel. I think you can do that, um, and and one can disagree, and I would have differences with the way they've gone about it. Um, can you defeat a ideology through our armed um, intervention? No, defeating an ideology is going to take a lot of other things, including a you know, progress towards a political solution to show that, you know, politics can, can work and deliver things. Um, uh, me, but, but, you know, but, but I think if you take the argument there's nothing more that can be done militarily, you just have to freeze things where we are now, you've then got to make an argument, well, how do you get the remainder of Hamas out of Gaza, get rid of the rocket launchers, get rid of the, you know, the, the, that, and that... I, I, my challenge to those from the Global South or friends in Arab states is to say, okay, let's, there's a ceasefire tomorrow. How do you get rid of Hamas's capacity to launch more rockets? How, how will you know when that moment has come as British Foreign Secretary? And is it your hope that the UK will be voting for a ceasefire at the UN in the near future? I would hope that we will we'll be voting. I mean, what we did is we defined what we wanted as a sustainable ceasefire. The Prime Minister said that at Prime Minister's Questions. And within a few weeks, that was adopted by the UN in Resolution uh, 2720 um, with unanimous, um, well, not unanimous agreement because the United States didn't vote in favor, but without a veto. Um, so that's our position. Um, yes, I look forward to the moment when this conflict is over. Uh, and of course, we, we spend a lot of time asking what Israel should do next to bring this to an end, to finish, the, you know. We should also, spend a nanosecond saying if Hamas wanted they could end this tomorrow they could lay down their arms they could leave Gaza you know they are the ones prolonging this conflict uh, you, in you, many ways you've warned against an unsustainable ceasefire that quickly collapses uh, mm -hmm. into further violence but there's a strong feeling I think in the international community and uh, in the public that the longer uh, violence continues and the, f the further uh, peace is away uh, that we're going to we're going to struggle to get to peace. I, I, I don't disagree with that. This, this, you know, but you we don't want really this to go on. No. I, so I, what I'd say, first of all, first of all, I would be in favour of humanitarian pauses, including right now. I mean, let's have another pause to try and get um, hostages out and to get more aid in. I, I'd be happy for us to do that now. What I'm saying about sustainable ceasefire is it does need. Hamas to no longer be capable of launching attacks into Israel. Otherwise, it's not, um, uh, it's not sustainable. And I hope that moment comes as quickly as possible. Yes. Uh, Florence, just take back for a moment. What is the UK's current legal position on whether or not Gaza is occupied? Um, our position is that, um, that Israel is um, fighting a campaign against Hamas we have to check regularly whether that is in compliance with international humanitarian law and assess that. Um, I don't think Israel regards itself as an occupying force, but whether that is correct, I would want to take legal advice because this comes to this issue about aid, where I think Israel needs to do more, a lot more, to get more aid into Gaza, which perhaps we can come on to. And forgive me, we know that Israel does not consider itself to be an occupying yeah. power, but British law currently does consider Gaza to be an occupied power. Can you, uh, oh, sorry, an occupied territory? Can you just confirm that on the record? I, I, I don't know the precise legal definition of that. I'd have to go back and check. Philip, I think I'm, we all know I'm, that the Foreign Office does know what the official legal position is. We, we describe we describe the territories as the occupied Palestinian territories, but oh, that's, that's a, a different question. That's a descriptor. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we should give you the, a piece of a written advice on the legal position. I think what the chair is asking is, do we consider Gaza to be occupied militarily at the moment? Is that what you're getting at? I'm asking for the, Br the British government's legal definition, whatever they consider to be the terminology of that you occupy, because as I understand it, 
There is no question that in law, under British law, and according to the UN Security Council Relation 23334, on which we have based our legal position, Gaza is an occupied territory. And therefore, from that, Israel does have obligations as an occupying power, whether or not they consider it to be or yes. not. British law does state that. And I would consider it to be quite fundamental that we knew exactly from what premise we were operating Okay, when well, I, 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 so as, you, as you know, we refer to them as the occupied Palestinian territories, um, but obviously Gaza was <laughs> left by <coughs> Israel. Mm. Um, but I think the question you're asking now is: is what Israel's done is that technically an occupation, and therefore do they have no. legal obligations? The point I would make is: look, whether or not they are de jure uh, occupying, they are de facto occupying Gaza, and therefore, when it comes to this issue of aid delivery. We need them to do more. At the moment, we're at about 150 trucks a day yeah. getting into Gaza. We need to be closer to 500. Every day that we're not closer to 500, we're going to have more people going hungry. We're going to have more people getting disease. There is a danger of, of there being really widespread hunger. At the moment, something like 90% of Gazans um, are getting less than one meal a day. And so I've set out with the Israelis a whole set of things that could happen that they could do that would make a real difference. You know, make sure Kerem Shalom is open seven days a week. Make sure the Nitzana checking point is open 24 hours a day. Make sure the aid convoys that are coming across Jordan have unhindered access into Gaza. Look at opening the port of Ashdod so aid can arrive by sea, go from Ashdod, either into Kerem Shalom or even better, go into the Erez crossing. Crucially, none of these things will work unless inside Gaza, you actually have um, UN personnel, trucks and fuel capable of taking the aid around Gaza. And again, only the Israelis can really fix that because there's a bunch of visa applications that are outstanding for people to be there. There's a need for armoured um, cars for that aid to be distributed and taken around with. And that needs to be fixed and it needs to be fixed urgently. I think I would also pay credit at this point uh, to you, Foreign Secretary, for what uh, the UK government has clearly done on aid. There is clearly much progress made as a result of that. But just for clarification, therefore, your words, Gaza is de facto occupied and therefore Israel has obligations as an occupying power, which you are saying today you accept, at least when it comes to I'm saying they have. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, have, so no, no, I, I need to be careful. I'm saying they have they responsibilities. Have obligations. No, I'm saying they've got responsibilities to make sure that aid gets through. It's not solely them. There are, so I've been to Al Arish myself. There are problems with Egyptian bureaucracy. There's problem with a lack of sort of overseeing logistics, working out what aid is going where. There are Ultimately, other bottlenecks, Israel but control. fundamentally there are some things the Israelis need to do um, because ultimately they have a lot of responsibility for what is happening in Gaza. I'm not giving you a legal definition because I'm not a lawyer. This is a, a moral and political point. They are occupying and fact they are not currently doing all they could be doing on aid and therefore what I they want should them be to doing. do more. Moving to the conduct of the military operation, I'd be interested in your assessment of Hamas's current capability, how much it's been degraded and what their intent is. Um, well, I have to be careful um, what I say, but I, I mean, I've seen figures suggesting that um, they have lost um, well over 50% of their capacity um, and capability in terms of being able to launch rockets and, and all the rest of it. Um, I don't think I can go further than that, um, but their, their ability to launch rockets into Israel has been significantly degraded, but as we've seen, they have still launched rockets in, in, in recent days. The, the Israelis obviously said over the weekend that they'd now dismantled Hamas's military infrastructure in the north of Gaza. Uh, you touched on your answer to Dan about the need for pauses. Is that not perhaps an opportunity that we bring in a humanitarian pause in the north of Gaza? If Hamas has been dismantled, as the Israelis are saying they have succeeded in doing so, do we need to look at you know, particular areas having humanitarian pause once it's appropriate? Otherwise, what is the objective currently in the north of Gaza as you understand yes, it? That's a very good point. I mean, what we have pushed for with um, Israel is to say consider humanitarian pauses. We haven't particularly focused on uh, an individual area, but frankly, anything would help when it comes to, you know, there are still... I mean, most of the Gazans have moved from the north to the south, so choice. it's more helpful to have a humanitarian pause covering the whole of Gaza because then you can get to the aid where most of the people are. But frankly, anything would help. Um, in fact, one of the issues we'd like the Israelis to look at is switching the water back on into northern Gaza because that would make a difference. 
So all of these things, but it's a good thought. All of I these think things. one of the challenges, obviously, that hasn't been no place that they could go as yet that was safe. Uh, so perhaps that provides an avenue. Um, President Biden, uh, as I'm sure you saw, I raised the Prime Minister, has said that there has been indiscriminate bombings that have taken place. You warned on the 23rd of November that civilian casualties in Gaza were too high and that Israel must abide by international <coughs> law. How have you, as Foreign Secretary, achieved a reduction in civilian casualties? Well, what we've done on every occasion of talking to, um, whether it's the Israeli Prime Minister or President or Minister Derma or... Um, um, Minister Gantz, who I spoke with recently, always make the point that, of course, we believe Israel has a right to defend itself and to deal with the Hamas threat, but it has to do so within international humanitarian law. It should try and avoid civilian casualties. And we were very clear that they needed to do better in the south than they did in the north. They say today that they are moving from a sort of combat phase to more of a stabilization phase. I, I don't fully know what they mean by that, but we definitely want them to do everything they can to try to move to a phase where civilians are less under threat. And forgive me, there's some sort of phrase the US use, which I'm not going to quote accurately, but something about friends in public punches behind the scenes. Do we think the UK or the US, and obviously the US has taken the lead on then, have been unable to restrain Israel in any way in terms of the way that it has conducted its airstrikes? I, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think that I'll answer a slightly different question, if I may. I think the relentless pressure that Israel felt over opening the Kerem Shalom crossing from mm -hmm. us and from Americans and others, I think that did make a difference. They eventually relented. Um, I would hope that what we've said, because we are a, a friend of Israel and we have um, been, a, been, been a helpful friend in many ways, on many occasions, I hope they listen to us. And so forgive me, when I asked the Prime Minister about the same topic, he said that he hadn't seen Israel's targeting. Have we asked to see Israel's targeting process or procedures? I, I haven't seen it. Um, Have we asked to see I, it? I haven't asked to see it. I, I don't think that that's something that they would share with us. They would share their collateral damage percentage that they're working to if we were asking them to do so. Well, they, they certainly, they've shared that in terms of, th they point out, but you know, one, one can say this is arguable, that they argue their collateral damage percentage compared with other conflicts shows that they are taking the issue of civilian casualties very seriously. So maybe I could get but I think that's a difficult, uh, you know, that, that is a difficult one to... I think it's a good way of holding them to account. And, and realistically, the UK normally operates, forgive me, Royston might uh, correct me, but I believe the UK normally operates around, it's around a 3% collateral damage percentage, whereas obviously a ministry will sign off for particular airstrikes where there may be requirement for a greater risk factor. Israel's or must be operating at a 20, 30. I mean, in the past, in 2014, they said they were working at a 20-something percentage. I'm just surprised that we don't know what their targeting percentage is in terms of, well, sorry, their civilian collateral damage percentage is, because that would be a direct way for us to have said to them, can you just get it down to below 10%? That, that is, I mean, th they do, in conversation, talk about what they think their percentages are. We don't think that's good enough, and we always push them to do more. We do know what their percentages are. Though. We know what they say they have. Okay. You know. um, final uh, question for me before I move on to Brendan. During the hostilities in Gaza uh, in 2014, your government uh, decided to review licences for arms exports to Israel um, and you committed not to grant any further licences until hostilities were ceased. I think there were 12 specific licences that you were concerned about at the time. Why has there been no review, cessation, pause, despite the fact there should be an automatic trigger that exists within the department to immediately suspend when there's a significant change on the ground? Well, the way this works is that, um, as I'm sure you, you know, that the, the grant of licenses is done by the Department of Trade on the advice of the Foreign Office, and the Foreign Office has to look at um, compliance with international humanitarian law based on an assessment of the um, commitment that Israel has, the um, capability that they have, can they actually deliver on this capability, and the compliance. And that assessment is, is carried out on a sort of rolling basis, and so it is sort of permanently reviewed, and were the circumstances to change and us to reach a different view, we'd advise the Department of Trade accordingly. The immediate handbrake that, for example, after the terrorist attack in Kosovo, there was an immediate handbrake put in place in terms of sales of arms to Serbia. There was no immediate handbrake, as I am aware of, on this situation, despite there having been an enormous terrorist attack and then a response. And there I hasn't think, been a specific I, I think it's review because of the circumstances. I mean, it, the circumstances are different because of 
October the 7th being such a hostile attack mm -hmm. on Israel um, and the government's position that Israel has a right to defend itself and a right to try and stop Hamas from launching future terrorist attacks, that there wouldn't be, be odd to have an automatic handbrake. What you have to do is assess on an ongoing basis, which is what we're doing. Israel has a, a full right to defend itself in international humanitarian law, but the British government has a duty to ensure that its export licenses are for arms exports are as accurate as they can be. So you are not aware of any review within the system formally, rolling basis, the point of a rolling basis that you have the emergency handbrake for when it, it's needed. It, it, well, it's as you described. I mean, it, but it you is put one in place, which is why I'm surprised that there hasn't been one in 2014. Yes, but when but the casualties are so much higher this time. Well, I, I think what I what I've described is what happens, which is, it's a decision for the Department of Trade based on advice from the Foreign Office, and that process is properly gone through. I, I just find it strange that when there were much lower levels of hostilities and activity, you put in place one as Prime Minister, and this time round despite the circumstances being so much more serious, there hasn't been a review. I think I'll answer the question. Let me take you away from process to more specifics. About two or three minutes ago, in answer uh, a reply to the chair, you said, and I quote, one of the things we'd like the Israelis to do is switch the water back on. Now, that says that they turned it off. It says that you recognise they have the power to turn it on. Therefore, isn't turning water off and having the ability to turn it back on but choosing not to, isn't that a breach of international humanitarian law? Well, it's just something they ought to do, in my no, opinion. No, I'm, uh, of course they should do it. Every it, human being would say yeah. you don't cut people's water supply off. But I'm asking you in your position as Foreign Secretary, well, I don't, around I mean, the point of international humanitarian law, if Israel have the power to turn the water back on that they turned off, surely that is a flagrant breach of international humanitarian law. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. My, my view is they ought to switch it on because uh, the north of Gaza, the conflict is now effectively over there and so getting more water and power into northern Gaza would be a very good thing to do. You don't have to be a lawyer to make a judgment about that, you just have to be a human being. Forgive me, Sir Philip, under international obligations do occupying powers have an obligation to provide access to water, yes or no? You're, you're asking me a technical Sir legal Philip, question. Sir Philip, I, I'm really, forgive me, you and I have played this dance enough times. We all know that under international law, there is an obligation for occupying powers to provide water. You asked me a technical question about occupying powers uh, and what their obligations are in international law. I imagine you're correct, Chair, but I'm, I'm also not a, uh, not a lie. I also just would point out, I Philip, don't... Just, just bear in mind, we want to have, uh, we've come to such a good place working with you because we have the confidence that you do know these details, and that's what your colleagues say, you know that it is not that you presume I'm correct, that is the duty on an occupying power. Yeah, uh, so yes. yeah, I think that, I think that is. is right, um, so, so, no, so yes, but I would also add that in answering your questions earlier about occupying, uh, occupy, yeah, occupation... I'm not asking you to apply it to Israel, the facts are though that they are required to. Uh, and, and just Lord Cameron, just to clarify, so you have received no advice at any point from any government lawyer that states that Israel is in breach of international humanitarian law? That's not what I said. No, that's why I'm asking you to clarify. Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to give exactly the same answer all over again, um, uh, which is what my role is, right? I'm not interested in the role, I'm interested in the legal advice you've received. Yes, well, the legal advice I've received is consistent with the fact that we have not changed our export um, it's not about arms procedures. exports, it's about international humanitarian law being upheld when it comes to aid, when it comes to way in which airstrikes have been prosecuted, everything else. We're, one question on arms exports, we've, we've moved from them <coughs> in um, any realm, in any respect. So you've never had a piece of paper put in front of you by a foreign office lawyer that says that Israel is in breach of its international humanitarian commitments under international humanitarian law. Um, look, I... I, I the reason for not answering this question, I can't recall every single bit of paper that's been put in front of me. I see, I look at everything. I mean, of course, there are lots of things that have happened where you think, well, surely that is that was something that shouldn't have happened, and uh, and so I don't want to answer that question because. I think I, in 2013, you were quite happy to say from the dispatch box that war crimes had been committed by the Assad regime when it came to chemical weapons use, and two years later, you were happy to say that Hamas had committed a war crime when they shot rockets into <coughs> Israel. Yeah, well, I do think there's a difference between. You know, using chemical weapons to kill people, and Israel fighting a, a conflict where they're trying to 
deal with a, a terrorist force that inflicted an appalling attack on it's their country. It's a difference country. in setting or specifics or scale, but not in principle, which was your willingness and ability to determine whether or not international <coughs> law had been broken. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get a lot further with this. Um, well, I mean, if you're asking me, uh, if you're asking me, yeah, sure. no, but if you're asking, am I worried that Israel have ta has taken action that might be in breach of international law because this particular premises has been bombed or whatever? Yes, of course I'm worried about that, and that's why I consult the foreign office lawyers when giving this advice on arms exports. So that's why I don't. So, so you're, if you put it that way, I'm happy to say yes, of course. Every day I look at what's happened and ask questions about, is this in line with international reality and law? Could the Israelis have done better to avoid civilian casualties? Of course I do that. We, we have no doubt that you'd ask those questions. It's about the response you've received. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that the question that you want to answer, yeah. but the question that I want to ask is the point, have you received legal advice which says that Israel is in breach uh, of international the humanity. The short answer to that is no. But 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 I but, but okay. I, I, okay. I, I, well, I want to qualify it instantly because it's not fair on the lawyers because of course the lawyers give you lots of advice saying look we're worried about this event that event this event that event we're going to go away we're going to consult with the Israeli authorities we're going to ask a bunch of questions and then we're going to give you considered legal advice given everything on the basis of you know capability commitment and everything else have they broken international law so that's why it's not really a yes or no answer well, but I, I'm trying to be helpful by how sort of explaining how the there. job works. Okay, I'll, I'll, does, that, I'll, does, that, does that help at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, this is, I think it's as good as we're going to get from you. Can I ask, uh, finally, um, uh, Chair, well, what assessment have you made of the Israeli ambassador's claim that every school, mosque and every second house in Gaza has access to tunnels and ammunition? Now, she said that in a television, in a television interview, and when pressed on whether that means a complete destruction of Gaza by Israel, she replied, and I quote, do you have another solution? So in your opinion, was she freelancing when she was speaking to that television interviewer, or I, was she speaking for the Israeli government? I, I don't um, okay. agree with that approach. Um, look, if you're asking me... No, I'm I, not asking you about the approach. I'm asking yeah. about do you think she was speaking to the know. Israeli government, I, I, or was I, she freelancing? I, I don't know. I would hope that, that that is not the position of the Israeli government, because it's the wrong position. Can I pivot to another issue around the West Bank? Because what's your view <coughs> of the increase in violence that has been there? And have you had conversations with the Israeli government to try and reduce it? Yes, I, I agree with you. I think what is happening in terms of settler violence is unacceptable. I've raised this, I think, in every conversation I've had with um, Israeli interlocutors. Uh, and we've gone one further than that, which is working with the Home Office. We have put in place um, travel bans on those people responsible for settler violence. Um, and uh, we have the opportunity, should we judge it right, to move that from a travel ban up to a full sanction, which obviously includes the travel ban and the asset freeze and, and other things. So we keep a, a very clear eye on this. You know, it is not right what is happening. It's it's. Uh, it's also, as well as being terrible for the Palestinian people that live there, this is long-term, you know, very bad for Israel because Israel needs fundamentally a two-state solution in order for it to have the security it needs. And so it needs to make um, the West Bank as a functioning political space. So why are we only seeing escalations then in the violence? Given the, you know, you're making representations, others are making representations, why is this not working? I think it's a range of you've got because of what happened on October the 7th and what's happened subsequently you've got a rise of tensions um, across uh, the occupied Palestinian territories and in the West Bank um, you've got the extreme you know settler movement who uh, you know um, have been perpetrating these acts uh, you've got some politicians in Israel that don't call them out indeed even support them and uh, that's why it's very important that proper friends of Israel, including Britain, do call this out and are very clear about it. So, given that you've announced that you're going to, we have banned uh, settlers uh, from entering the UK, what would be the trigger to up that to full sanction? What would be the trigger in your mind? I think it's a very good question, uh, and I can't give you a absolute hard and fast answer. I think a sense that if this continues, if it gets worse, if more acts are carried out. 
um, then we'd, we'd consider taking the travel ban up to a full sanction. But more acts being carried out. They are being carried out. This is happening all the time. So I'm, I must press the point. No, no, I, know, well, I, don't, I don't. I mean, I, I, if you're asking for a sort of matrix for the decision, I don't have one, but it's a very good point, and I'll, I'll go away and think about it. But there's no hesitation. I mean, our view is this is not right. We need to act. You should use your sanctions and your deterrence in the smartest way you can, and we're very we're happy to do that. Very quickly before Royston takes us into the wider conflict, you, you touched earlier about the need for reconstruction, your first answer. Um, Israel has said that they are looking to the EU and the US to reconstruct and pay for the reconstruction of Gaza. Can I ask if you agree with that? I think it's going to take a giant international um, effort. Um, because the level of the destruction is so great. Um, I think we're going to have to try and bring together, I know this is something that your committee's looked at, bring together a whole group of countries that include the Arab and, um, uh, Arab, Arab and, and <coughs> Muslim states. We're going to have to bring together the main European powers and America into some form of, of, of contact group that, that works on this together. Um, we're going to need as many people as possible to join the effort. Should it not be for Israel, though, to lead on the reconstruction? I mean, to go to Randall's point, they were able to find $70 million to fund the expansion of illegal settlements over the next year, despite lobbying by this government to stop that. Surely Israel should be leading on the reconstruction. I think, I think it's going to take, it will take more than any one country to do this. And then very briefly, on the, on the point you touched on the contact group, obviously I have been urging the creation of a Palestine contact group. One of those aspects would be, for me, the priority is track to diplomacy. You know, we need to get civil society, women, youth, other groups in the room who are ready to talk about a long-term peace the day after, as His Majesty uh, from Jordan wishes to refer to it as. Are we even anywhere close to bringing together track to diplomacy? Because that is something the UK could lead on and could do now. I think there's a lot of conversations taking place about this. Obviously, one of the difficulties is... Um, some countries have been less inclined to talk about it until the conflict is over. Um, but I think you've seen in recent days, you know, an Egyptian plan, you've even seen the Israelis talk about what should happen in Gaza after this conflict is over. So I think the space is opening up, but the conversations are taking place now.